This is a reading from Goat Sucker Harvest by me, Joyce Barris. As you can see, it's available on in paperback from Amazon uh, here and in the US. And also, it's available on Kindle worldwide and on Kindle Unlimited for free. This is a section from Chapter 5, Cardike. All was still when they arrived at Cardike House. After the buffeting that Thurza had been treated to in the trap, her ears hissed with the silence. A walnut dining table and writing bureau, glass cabinets with finest bone china and ornaments, were all arranged to catch the attention and make the most of the light from a huge window facing back across the fen. The stained glass panels caught Thurza's attention and she smiled in delight at the purple, crimson and golden light sent fanning across the damask tablecloth, turning the glasses and silverware into goblets and chalices from Thurza's dreams. The view to the horizon was only obscured by the trees that surrounded Foljam Hall. Thurza thought the hall looked as if it was trying to turn its back in embarrassment at having its privacy so compromised by the proximity of Cardike House and the presence there of its worthy bailiff. The quiet atmosphere was shattered by the entrance of the lady of the house. Oh, here you are at last, Teresa. Look at you, hair quite wild with the wind. Wind blown as a rabbit in the mouth of a blunderbuss, laughed Darnell, with a glance that Thursa felt sure was taking in her every imperfection. You ride so hard, my love, scolded Emma with an exaggerated tutting. Thursa was fussed over and settled into a chair. Emma fluttered here and there, adjusting curtains and rearranging plates. Thurza wondered which delicacy among the display of pastries, buns and sweetmeats on the table might be the famous coconut cake about which her aunt had made such extravagant boasts. She was more used to having hard biscuits and homely fare than the offerings placed before her on glistening china and lace doilies today. When the silvery tinkle of the French ormolu clock over the fireplace had reminded them several times that quarter hours were passing with little progress to their meeting in between. Thurza interrupted Emma's monologue of trivia. This is a beautiful spread, Aunt. Did your new cook make all these lovely things? Emma sank into another chair as Darnell came to lean on the mantelpiece. Before Emma could resume her prattle, it was Darnell who spoke. The last maid it was a pretty thing, but uh, she was a troubled soul. The thing she would say, Emma almost shouted, but Darnell, pulling up a stool and sitting beside his wife and niece with his boots stretched onto the hearth rug, finished her sentence for her. The thing she would say sometimes got her into trouble, so for kindness sake we had to let her go. Like the one before, it was so young, so little idea, Emma gabbled on, shrill as usual, but Thurza sensed a desperation in the way that she rubbed at Jar Darnell's shoulder and seemed to watch his face for signs of approval. Exactly like the one before, my dear, he said, inexperienced and rather simple-minded, unaccustomed to the ways of gentlemen. Of, of gentlemen and ladies, added Emma, looking at Darnell, as if she'd forgotten both the cakes and the pressing news she promised Thurza. The cakes lay untasted and the tea was getting thoroughly stewed in the fancy pot. Thurza wondered if her aunt had forgotten she was there solely at their invitation, not a new stick of furniture to be fluttered round. Unaccustomed to the ways of the world, she had an unfortunate manner which experience will correct, God willing, Darnell concluded. Where is your plate, Teresa? You must try the coconut cake. The receipt is a close-regarded secret and the ingredients imported especially, I believe. 
Neither the hoy nor indeed the polloi have tasted this. Fursa tried to guess which of the slices now tilted her way was the famous confection. Nobody before you, dear Thursa, said Darnell. He took the plate from Emma's hands and indicated one of the palest slabs of gatto. Fursa took it, thankful to have been spared, showing her ignorance of such refinement by helping herself to a more lowly example of the baker's art. She took a bite. Her mouth filled with the prickly texture of straw and horsehair, and a sickly sweetness like treacle mixed with the sawdust. Your new cook's clever to make something, <coughs> she coughed, searching for a polite word that would also be true. So different. Delicious would have been cruel flattery. Different it certainly was from anything Thursday had tasted on land or sea. It's a little rich for me, of course, Emma was back into her stride, for the more refined palate has a delicacy of discernment that cannot be taught. Neither taught nor corrected, Thursa realised her Uncle Darnell murmured these words for her hearing alone. Aunt Emma was opening one of the cabinets, taking out a small ornament to show her new captive audience. See this, Teresa. Here were no clues, no forewarnings. Thursa was on her own to decide what she was looking at. The lump of greenish stone studded with tiny jewels seemed at first to be a bird, but the way it was twisted made Thursa think of a fish contorting as it was drawn in on a fisherman's line. Really, we don't have time for a full inventory of the crockery and bric-a-brac. Darnell's eyes took on a lively glint of steel that Thursa hadn't seen there before. It made her heart cringe inside her chest to see how Emma recoiled from him, returning the ornament to its place on the shelf with shaking hands. To the news and then to the trap. Thursa looked from her uncle to her aunt. What's this wonderful news? she asked aware that tension was developing between Darnell and Emma. The pigeon-like fluttering of her aunt was intensifying into a nervous tailspin. Uh, Lady Laura Grey, uh, I mean Charlesworth, her aunt stammered, of Full Jam Hall. Darnell's heavy breathing betrayed his impatience, though his gaze was impassive. Emma closed her eyes. She seemed to be trying to avoid swooning from the strain of keeping the overwhelming excitement of the revelation to herself for so long. Lady Laura has been so gracious as to offer to give you a trial.